All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Curbing Traffic Violence Strategies for Safer Streets. We are going to give it just a couple moments for people to join. Um, it looks like we're live, but as you're joining, uh, find the chat feature in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and let us know who you are and where you're joining from and uh, we'll get started shortly. Welcome, Karina. Great to see you here. Hi, Michelle. Beautiful St. Paul. Hi, Susan. Hey, Rick. All right. A lot of people here, Murray. Uh, we have people joining from Atlanta, which is awesome. Welcome, Mary. Hi, Amy. Hey, Tina. Hi, Pat. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, again, we're we're just going to give it just a couple moments for people to join. As you're joining, uh, find the chat feature. Let us know who you are and where you're joining from, and uh, it should be a great discussion today. Hey, Steve, thanks for joining. We love Metro Transit. Uh, also, Steve, hi. Hello, Al, Tony, Joanne, Ethan. Great to see you all here. Hey, Adam, welcome. Hey, David, Brian, Shelley. All right, just a few more moments. Hi, Heidi. All right, so um, I think we can get started. Uh, we have a great, uh, great turnout today. So thank you all for being here. Um, Becky, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, we can get going. All right, so uh, welcome everyone. My name is Alex Burns and I work at Move Minneapolis. We are a nonprofit uh, focused on promoting sustainable commuting. And we offer a number of free programs and services all with the intention of improving air quality and reducing climate emissions. I'd encourage you to check out our website. It's moveminneapolis.org. Um, and please reach out, we'd love to to meet with you and, and tell you more about the services that we offer. And uh, next slide. We, one of those programs and uh, that, that we've been offering, especially lately, has been webinars uh, like the one that you're at here today. Um, and next month, we're going to be convening a conversation about school transportation, which uh, should be great. And it, it's really an important topic, especially now, because 12 to 14% of all morning rush hour traffic is from school transportation, which can be a little surprising to some, but um, we try, uh, just like the conversation today, we try to convene conversations on the biggest topics in transportation. And as schools uh, open back up and, and welcome students back, we anticipate that this could be an issue uh, as, as people and parents evaluate, do they send their kids on the school bus? Do they have to drive them? Are there other options? So uh, we look forward to talking about this and more. Again, it's going to be in January. Um, so look for that on our website. I'm sure we'll also send out a notice as soon as that registration link is posted. Uh, so, uh, one more note, uh, many of you have used this to introduce yourself today, but I would encourage you to use the chat uh, throughout this discussion to ask questions and share comments. I'll do my best to monitor it and make sure that each one is answered. We're going to try to answer them live throughout the panel discussion, and then we also have some time at the end to take your questions as well. So. Um, it's always fun when the, the chat is going and, and folks are active, so make sure to use that feature throughout uh, today's discussion. 
Today's discussion uh, centers around the topic of traffic violence and the question of how to make our streets safer places to walk, bike, take transit, and drive. And I'd like to begin with this map of Minneapolis. This map shows every crash over a 10 year period in which a person, person was killed or suffered life altering injuries. And I should note that this does not include the interstates in the city. But I think it's important uh, for us to begin with this and to, to remember that each dot on this map was a tragedy, uh, the impacts of which are still felt today. And there's been a lot of discussion this year about the impacts of traffic violence, uh, the underlying reasons for it and strategies to prevent it. And today we've convened a panel of experts to talk about this and I'm really excited to introduce them now. So our panel today, uh, next slide, Becky, thank you. Uh, our panel today is um, made up of three local experts on this subject. Uh, first, we have Ashwat uh, Narayanan, who is the executive director of Our Streets Minneapolis, which is an organization dedicated to improving walking, biking, and rolling infrastructure in the city. He is a nationally recognized expert on building more just, sustainable, and resilient transportation infrastructure. Ash has authored or co-authored numerous reports on these subjects, he represents District 8 on the Metropolitan Council's Transportation Advisory Board. He was appointed to the Minnesota Department of Transportation Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee. And Ash also serves on the board of directors for the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability. Ash, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we also have Dr. Dr. Nicole Morris, who is the director of the Human First Laboratory in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, uh, she is also a research scholar at the Center for Transportation Studies and a graduate faculty member of the Human Factors and Ergonomics program, all at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Her research interests include human factors, safety, gender disparities, judgment and decision making, uh, and usability. A selection of her research has examined pedestrian safety, usability, and design of crash report interfaces. Um, and we are really happy to have Nicole, uh, Dr. Nicole Morris here today. Thank you, Nicole. And finally, uh, Ben Shardlow, who is the urban plan, is an urban planner focused on improving complex urban public spaces as director of urban design for the Minneapolis Downtown Council and the Downtown Improvement District. Ben advocates for better public realm through street redesigns, park and plaza projects, and private property redevelopments. In addition, he facilitates collaborative work at, with community partners, addressing root causes of public space challenges relating to nightlife, homelessness, and transportation infrastructure. Ben holds a master's degree in planning from the Humphrey School and has professional experience in applied social research and real estate development. Um, so that's our panel for today, and I'm really excited about this discussion. Again, as this uh, conversation unfolds, please post your questions in the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. Um, and we can get started. So, uh, Becky, you can, there we go, let's stop sharing. Uh, so first question for you all. I would just like to start by asking, what is the status of transportation safety in, in Minneapolis and in America? Like how, how are we doing, uh, how, how are we doing relative to other places? I can go first, uh, Alex, if that's fine. Um, thank you uh, everybody for this opportunity. It's great to be on this panel too, with you, Dr. Morris and uh, Ben as well. So uh, to your question, Alex, short answer, we're not doing that great. Um, I think all, each and every one of us knows someone who's been killed or badly hurt in a car crash. Um, car crashes are the leading cause of death for children in our country. Um, and there's also a huge racial disparity in who is affected by traffic crashes. 
Uh, Native American community members are five times more likely to be killed in a uh, car crash compared to white Americans and, and black Americans are three times more likely to be killed while walking. Um, and so, you know, a big reason for that is that we've designed our cars for getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible without really thinking about what this means for our communities and for the people who live in them. Um, as an example, today, 20% of Minneapolis's land area is given over to the storage and movement of our cars. Um, freeways cut through our historic neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, we've also given over so much of our space, especially in downtown, to uh, parking. But I also, in terms of traffic safety, just want to touch on a couple of other points. There are many other sort of insidious effects of our transportation system that we often don't think about when we talk about safety, uh, which includes, you know, increased cardiovascular disease, for example, and diabetes because of a lack of access to um, active transportation infrastructure. Uh, people who live close to freeways breathe worse air. And then there are other considerations like, you know, as a woman or someone who's trans, do you feel safe uh, while you're walking around your city? Uh, as a black man, do you feel safe from police violence while you're biking? So I think when we're talking about tra traffic safety, it's really important to consider these things in a systemic and intersectional perspective. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there. I'm really looking forward to what uh, Dr. Morris and Ben have to say. Okay, well, I, I'll go next. And again, thank you for, for having me. And, and, and please, um, the, the formalities can, can go to the wayside and, and I prefer Nicole. So thank you for that. Um, so, so I agree. I mean, we're not doing particularly well in, in terms of, of traffic violence and, and roadway safety. So I, as, as if you follow me on Twitter, you know I like to do this, where really, how, how do we visualize the, the number of deaths that we have on, on any given number of sort of tragedies that we're experiencing? And so we have around 37,000 deaths of Americans each year. And so if you can imagine target field, full to the rim and, and all of those smiling faces and, and those are someone's loved ones, um, all of them gone every year. We, we fill up that stadium and we lose every single person that, that is in it. Um, and, and so that that is a tragedy that, that we have lost sight of the magnitude of it and, and that sort of greater scale of what's going on in our country with COVID, but, but still the, the tragedies persist. And, and ultimately, the, the other thing that is, is startling is, you know, I've, I've worked in transportation for, for a long time, and, and we really were enjoying the, this decline in, in roadway deaths over the last decade, and, and that has really stopped, and, and we are starting to move in the other direction. And so I think the alarm bells are, are starting to, to sort of sound for us where a lot of the low-hanging fruit has been captured and, and the gains that we have made and in terms of trauma, uh, emergency response and, and vehicle protections for occupants, I think we have sort of reached the limit of, of what we are going to, to see gains for, for quite some time until we have some other really drastic innovations. And, and we're starting to see harms in other realms. Um, you know, I, I remember nine years ago when I arrived in Minnesota, Katie Fleming at, at MnDOT was in a meeting with me and, and she said, you know, we're really starting to see our, our vulnerable users, our, our pedestrians and bicyclists starting, those deaths are starting to climb. And, and she was right. I mean, that has continued. And now we, it, we're just at, a, at a, a really frenzied pace of these deaths where we have to do something drastic to start making gains again. I agree with all of that. It's uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be part of this panel, Alex. And it's great to spend this time with you, Ash and Nicole. I'm, I'll just pick up on two things. One, I completely agree that if you look back over the most of the last several decades, if you said the phrase transportation safety to people, what they would picture is uh, a car that gets safer and safer. It's kind of a consumer product problem to solve. Like, can we design something that preserves the, the life of the people inside it. Um, and you can really see the impact that has had on how our vehicles are designed. They're getting bigger um, and they're getting far deadlier to people who aren't in a vehicle on the road. So that is, uh, we're seeing the results of that. Um, I'll also say just that it seems like 
um, over the 10 years that I've been working on this, it feels like the, um, the visibility of this as an issue has, has improved. And I think there has been, um, there has been progress made on addressing some of the root causes that are creating unsafe streets for people. Um, but we have a lot more to do. That's, uh, that's a good lead in to a follow up question. And each of you kind of touched on this a little bit, but let's talk about those root causes. Um, like Nicole, you mentioned that the alarm bells are going off. We're starting to see some of these statistics um, start moving in the wrong direction. Why, why is that? Do we know why um, we continue to see 37,000 people die on our streets every year? and why in some cases that number is getting worse. Right, so the, the most challenging thing about working in this field is that there, there is no silver bullet and, and there's no one thing that's happening. There, there are thousands of things that are happening simultaneously, some canceling the other out and, and that makes this incredibly difficult problem to solve. And I, I often like to talk about transportation or the, the system as a whole, sort of like the, the sponge of society. So you really think about all the things that are wrong with our society in terms of racism and, and you know, toxic masculinity and individualism and substance abuse and mental health issues, all of these things show up on our streets. And so it's, this is what makes it so difficult to, to address with any one program, any one implementation, any one technology, because it is systematic, it's institutional. There are all of these things that sort of show up on our streets in the, in the form of heavy machinery and, and wreak havoc on, on our safety and our well being. And, and so I think that that's really the challenge, and, and at times makes me feel. Uh, a little overwhelmed, uh, you know, how, how can I make change when I can't solve, you know, alcoholism in this country, I can't solve sort of white supremacy in this country, I can't solve the, the growth of automobiles. And, and so um, I, I sort of just have to take a step back and, and think, well, I can only do what I can do and, and, and try to raise the visibility of these issues. But, but I think that's really, to, to me, what's driving a, a lot of this. We have a couple questions that are related to this in the chat um, that I'll add. So Steve asks, um, the map that, that we showed earlier, it seems to be heavy. Uh, it, it seems to show that the heaviest deaths, uh, rates of deaths and injuries are where the most traffic is. So um, have we converted these to a volume adjusted measure? Um, I That map is just, all of the incidents that have happened in the last 10 years. But I guess that could be more of a broader question of like, where do these things tend to happen? Um, and then we have another question that uh, this person asks, what part of these incidents would you uh, attribute to distracted driving? Um, and what does, how does distracted driving play into uh, the problems that we're seeing? I could take a crack at those. I think the one of the one of the patterns that you'll see is that if you look at that map again and consider the design speed of those roads, I mean, for the most part, we're dealing with road roads where, at, at, especially looking backwards, it's been a goal of the system for for cars to fly down those corridors as fast as they can. And they've been designed sometimes with speed limits in the 30s or 40s. And if that's the case, we know that the impact that a moving vehicle has on a person who's walking, biking, or rolling um, is often fatal because there's a real inflection point at 20 miles per hour. So if somebody gets hit below that, they'll probably survive. And if, if not, then they won't. So I think that's one way to read it. I think it is. It's also true that if you, I take Steve's point, but it also seems like um, if our community has a goal to end traffic fatalities, then kind of 
any one in any location on a busy street or a quiet street isn't acceptable. So it's, I think we can, we'll get more into that in the conversation. And I guess the more uh, factual answer is no, I haven't adjusted that map for volume based metrics. But I Alex, if I, yeah. Could I jump yeah. in here too? Uh, one thing I do want to mention is um, the city of Minneapolis has done some pretty good research on where crashes are happening throughout the city and you showed that map. And that map shows us that just, you know, 7% of all of our streets in the city are responsible for, uh, I'm sorry, 9% of all of the streets in the city are responsible for 70% of the worst crashes. Um, and not only are they also responsible for, uh, you know, severe fatal and uh, severe and fatal crashes, they also have higher crash rates. So, um, but I also want to make the point that just because we see higher traffic volume on these streets doesn't mean that we have to accept severe injuries and fatalities on those streets as well. And then the second point is we also see that as traffic volumes go up, crashes also go up. Uh, and so reducing the total number of trips that are made by single occupants vehicles, the trips that are made by cars is going to be a critical piece of getting to a safer transportation system in general. And I, I just wanna share uh, one, the, 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 you know, a screen up here um, to kind of give you an example of what uh, a typical street on what the city of Minneapolis calls its high injury crash network looks like. Uh, and these streets are disproportionately unsafe. They have, you know, wide travel lanes like you see here on West Broadway Avenue in North Minneapolis. Uh, these are often 11, 12, 13 foot lanes that encourage high speeds. They have higher speed limits like Ben was just saying. There's a lot of weaving traffic uh, and there's not very good pedestrian or bike infrastructure at all. And so many of the streets on our high injury crash network look like this, and they don't have to be. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll just stop there and turn it back to you, Alex. Hi, so. so if, if, if I, um, so I know that there please. was the other question about distraction and, and so what percentage or what number of those are, are distraction and, and I, I uh, for warning, I'm not always popular when I talk about this topic, but actually when, when we're thinking about fatal crashes, the, the number of fatal crashes that have um, distraction as a contributing factor is, is fairly low and much lower than what people assume it is. So if you walk down the street and you ask any, any person, what is the leading cause of death on our roadway systems, leading cause of traffic deaths, they would almost uniformly say texting and driving and they would be wrong. Um, so when we think about the, the number of, or the, the percentage of our fatal crashes in, in the United States that have distracted driving as a, as a contributing factor, we're about, you know, eight to 10% of those fatal crashes, and that's all distraction. And then of those that are coded as cell phone related, we're at about 1% to 2%. Now, of course you're saying, well, I don't trust the data and, and that's fine. Um, the, the data is flawed and it is very difficult for police officers to be able to discern whether or not the driver was using their cell phone on their cell phone, reading a text, sending a text, right? The, the list goes on. Um, but, I, but I think it is important to, to sort of look at a couple things. One is all, all crashes, so injury crashes, property damage crashes, the, the percentage is higher. So it sort of will go up to around 30% when we're talking about uh, lower injury or property damage only crashes. Um, and, and so I think I, I raise the issue for two things. One is distracted driving is dangerous and kills people and there's no doubt about that. Two, we know that in this country, sometimes up to about 50% of our fatal crashes are unbelted, 30% are speed related. 30% are alcohol related. So we have these big killers on our roadway that, that we don't talk about and we, we're spending millions talking about distracted driving. Um, and, and I always worry that that is to the detriment of safety because it's an easy scapegoat and we don't wanna talk about these other things. And, and so, um, you know, right, speed and alcohol kill. And, and that's what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about distracted driving as, as, as tragic and as dangerous it is. I, I never want to talk about it. I always want to talk about speed, alcohol, and belts because that's what I know kills people. I, Alex, can I jump into the, yeah. I totally agree with you, Nicole. And I, it seems like the, 
We can also look to other communities around the country and the world that have made progress in reducing traffic fatalities. Um, and I know that in those places, it's often uh, an operating principle that you can design transportation systems in which people can make small mistakes and not die. So you, it is possible other places are doing it. And it's also true that if you institute um, a level of, kind of infrastructure design with the appropriate level of traffic calming, that people are paying attention. Like you, you have to pay attention because you're moving slowly and, and it's a more, um, it's less of a highway wide lane design for speed situation. I, I'd like to ask about the, the narrative around these statistics. Um, Nicole, you, you kind of touched on this, but what, and you mentioned this statistic that uh, about 37,000 people die every year in, from traffic violence in America. And that's, that's similar to like, uh, I think it's about 40,000 people in America die from gun violence every year. Um, but we talk about we talk about these things differently. And I think sometimes deaths in car crashes and in uh, traffic violence, like they're kind of treated like this nasty but necessary uh, side effect of, of our transportation system. And I'd be curious to get your thoughts on why this is. Why, why do we just kind of take these, you know, accept these deaths and injuries on our streets. Right. I, you know, I think part of this that that we we sort of are a, a bit dismissive or, or accept these deaths is because I, you know, I sort of feel like at heart, everyone is complicit and we all know that we're complicit. You know, we're, we're all complicit of this system. We participate in the system. We benefit from the system. And, and so we, we accept the deaths because we really don't want things to change. We don't want some of our conveniences to change. And, and the other piece of, of this is it sort of gets to this idea of prospect theory with an, if any are sort of love of economists are, are in, in the audience, but prospect theory really talks about this S-shaped curve when you think about the, the, the good feeling and bad feeling we get from, from gains and losses. And so initial losses, we feel very painfully. And, and the more losses you feel, we still feel more pain, but the pain really diminishes. And, and so, if, you know, we've sort of seen this in fast forward speed with COVID where the first 30,000 deaths that we felt in this country, we all felt those very painfully. And of course we felt more pain with the next 30,000, but now we're at over 300,000 and we're not feeling each 30,000 deaths with the same pain as what we felt the first 30,000 deaths. And I feel like that's what happens now with these traffic crashes. Every year we lose over 30,000 people. And yes, it hurts, but it doesn't hurt in the same way because we have just been in these losses for so long that we've lost sight of what it means to, to lose people. And, and so, you know, I think that's really what the, the issue is. We, we have just accepted that, that, that this is the way it is. Um, I just want to build on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, just a little bit of what uh, Nicole was saying. Um, you know, I, I think we've. Been, I, I think because of some of the things that Nicole was saying, we've really prioritized safety way below other factors in our transportation system, like congestion, car travel speed, uh, whether there's parking available. Um, and I also just want to point out how some of the this acceptance that. Nicole was talking about of, of just mass casualties on our streets uh, are baked into our policy. Uh, I'm a traffic engineer myself. You know, and traffic engineering is one of the only professions where we try to predict the number of deaths that will happen on a street that we design. Um, and I, I want to uh, point out, you know, that state departments of transportation across the country are under no obligation to reduce the number of roadway fatalities that they have on their streets in order to receive federal funding. Uh, I was reading this report that said 18 states in 2018 established targets for pedestrian deaths that were higher than the number of people killed or injured uh, in the previous year. This should not be acceptable. Um, one, one thing I'd like to point out is if, if an architect were designing a building and just by using that building as it were intended to, 
if a certain number of people were dying in that building, we would not find that acceptable. Yet somehow we find that culturally acceptable on our streets. Um, and so I, I really want to give credit to you know, the city of Minneapolis who have said that this is not acceptable and have instituted a program, uh, Vision Zero Minneapolis, um, that seeks to eliminate severe injuries and fatalities on our streets. Sorry, Ben, I interrupted you just as we were getting started. No, I like what you said better than I, what I was going to say, but I, I'll just chime in and say all that is um, true and uh, devastating. And I, I think the, the other part of the story is just that in terms of the, the era of land use planning and transportation planning that we've been in, I think it's important to confront the reality in this region, which is that we're six, seven decades into houses being built in places that where people will need to drive 60 miles per hour for 30, 45, 60 minutes to get to a job center. And so you have a whole lot of investment going to where our stuff is getting built and how it's getting built. Um, and then you have, um, you have American car culture. You have the fact that the, what is, the, the idea of the freedom of the open road is how cars have been sold and car-centered lifestyles are sold. Um, and the reality um, of driving into a congested area or, or driving with a few hundred thousand of your closest friends to try to fight across the metro to get from one side to the other is, is, not, is not freeing. And there are consequences that we accept as inevitable like traffic violence that, that it's gonna take a lot of concerted effort to get get past because we are, we have been building our stuff the wrong way for a long time. Is it, is it possible to eliminate traffic deaths? Like has this, are there cities or countries that where people don't die in, in car crashes? It, anyone can, <laughs> I, anyone can respond to that. I mean, I think it's absolutely possible. Um, you know, when, when I think about what's possible here, so, so I feel like we don't really even need to look at what's possible in other countries. I think, I think we can look at sort of uh, here. So do we have days where no one dies on a roadway? Yes, right, do we have weeks? Yes, and, and so if we can do it for any stretch of time, we can prolong those those safety windows and and so I feel like if if there's any day that we can we can have a day where no one dies that tells me that it's possible for those days to go on and on and on but of course you know we're not prioritizing here today to make those days go on and on and on like we see in other countries like in Sweden uh, for for example where they really are uh, prioritizing and and every sort of level to make that happen And just to add on to that, um, I think, yes, yes, it is absolutely possible. Um, and the, one of the big things is that our streets are dangerous by design. Um, as, uh, and as I showed you that photo earlier, there are streets that are safer and then there are streets that are more dangerous. And I think, um, you know, changing the characteristics of these streets to make them um, more people-centered and less car-centered is going to be one of the key ways that we actually address this problem. And then um, also, again, pointing out that a lot of our most dangerous streets lie disproportionately in communities of color and neighborhoods of color. This is no accident. Um, and finally, I just want to you know, talk about the system itself. You know, when we call it traffic violence, I feel a little hesitant because I think this creates a framework of people who, you know, like who, a frame, so people who are perpetrators and then people who are victims, when in fact, I think it's the whole system that is kind of responsible for a lot of the severe injuries and fatalities that we all kind of suffer collectively. And I really see this as a public health issue. Um, and if we approach it from a public health standpoint, I think, yes, we absolutely can eliminate severe injuries and crashes on our streets. I think that's really well said, Ash. I think the only thing I would add is that um, when we talk about a heavy topic like this, it, it, it feels like 
hard to even articulate this, but it feels like we're trying to solve a problem. But the good news is that when you solve this problem and you create streets that are safer for people, people love them. Like even when you have more space for pedestrians, when it's easier for people to cross the street, when there are safe routes for people to bike and scoot, we, we, we know those places, we have some, they're a lot safer and they're really enjoyable to be in and they're good for business and they're good for communities. So it's, it's kind of by, by virtue of solving this problem, we can make things safer and actually a lot more enjoyable. We, we have a lot of questions coming in, which is great. And um, we're gonna do our best to answer all of these. And one question from Paul asks about um, county, uh, federal, state, and county maintained roads. And specifically if Hennepin County has bought into reducing the speed and making changes uh, to this road. And that's, it's related to a question that I wanted to ask because in places like uh, Washington Avenue downtown. Um, and part of the reason that traffic safety has been in the news recently is because in uh, COVID and during the pandemic, we've seen increases or, or at least more visible examples of like risky driving behavior, uh, like drag racing or uh, just speeding in general. Um, I, I've seen reporting that instances like this are up and uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And like, um, I, Washington is a, is a county street um, in downtown Minneapolis. Why are we seeing um, it? Why are we seeing more risky driving behavior now? And are we seeing them in certain places and not others? And I guess, um, <laughs> Ash, it, you, if you want to speak to that with, because uh, I know our streets has been working on um, county streets and uh, Nicole, uh, well, anyone can speak to it, but uh, Ash, it sure. might make sense for you to respond. I'll go real, I'll try to go really quickly here. Um, so I did mention, you know, this high injury crash network that I showed you. It's actually 114 miles of, of, of all of our streets. Um, and uh, over 50% of those streets are actually outside of the control of the city of Minneapolis. And so I think that is another kind of barrier to achieving safer streets citywide because there's just a maze of bureaucracy involved in who has control for maintaining and operating a lot of the streets that we live and work and play on. Um, and so uh, even if the city of Minneapolis achieves all of its goals on Vision Zero, that still leaves a large proportion of streets that are operated by other entities like MnDOT and Hennepin County uh, that also need to be tackled. Um, having said that, uh, to your point, Alex, about uh, why people wear, you know, people are drag racing and things like that. I think people drag race on a street that looks like it's built for drag racing. So if it's if it kind of looks like a freeway, that's prime, I think where that's where you'll go and gravitate to do that. So. Um, I, I fundamentally think one of the work, one of the things that we're trying to do at Our Streets Minneapolis is build awareness amongst people in Minneapolis that they're, it's not just the city who has control over the streets, it's also Hennepin County, it's also the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Uh, we need to hold those entities to the same standard that we hold the city of Minneapolis to. We think the city of Minneapolis should do more to hold these other entities uh, accountable as well. And I think we think that the county can do a lot more to make sure that the streets they own and operate actually work for the people who live along those streets. So the, the current state of, of safety and some of the risk taking that we're seeing, part of that is, is really a, a byproduct of COVID. So our, our average daily traffic is much lower and, and it is creating allowances because our streets are built so large and, and really to allow for so much capacity and we're not and we're meeting those capacity levels to which they're they're built. They really do, are creating these massive runways, and and so, you know, really the the desire I think, and and the behavior and the ability to prevent all of these these risk taking behaviors. None of that has really changed. But what has changed is just people's ability to execute that because there's just not a lot of cars in their way, and and so some of this I think will will 
die out a little bit once once we start to resume to to more traffic patterns. But but back to an earlier comment about things just cancel each other out. And so, you know, it's like ADT often is to the detriment of safety and, and when it's high and now it's really low. And that's also to the detriment of safety. I mean, uh, sometimes you think, can we we just can't win with the system that we have. And so we need a whole new one. So let's talk about the strategies to make streets safer. Like what we, we've mentioned a few of them, uh, like speed and, and uh, just street design in general, but what strategies are proven to be effective at keeping people safe when they're moving in our streets? Do we, do we have, is there research that shows what are the, the best strategies uh, moving forward? So I can talk a bit about about my research um, on on pedestrian safety and and you know this this is really limited to to um, a, a couple of studies but we did a, a project looking at the stop for me program in St Paul and and really what we were tasked with looking there is how effective is the high visibility enforcement of St Paul Police Department doing enforcement to the crosswalk law in St Paul. And so we, we worked to measure that, having some baseline sites around the city where no treatment was going. And then we, we enhanced that program by adding in additional engineering, so low cost engineering like the R1-6 uh, in street signs, those, those little skinny yellow signs that you see in the roadway, along with those blue feedback signs that some of you may have seen saying what the percentage of drivers were, were yielding. And we were able to increase the, the rate that drivers stopped for pedestrians in St. Paul, not only at our treated sites where there was engineering and enforcement underway, but also the sites where there was no treatment. So, so we started to sort of see this groundswell where we were starting to change the culture where people were beginning to stop for pedestrians everywhere. And so that was a successful study at the end of the study, though, as any good research project is, we were left with more questions. And really, one of the big questions was, what was the strength of the individual components? So we were really tasked to, to study the program, which was the Stop For Me program, and, and hands with these other components, and not whether or not that engineering and education could achieve the same on its own, or what, what did you get with the, the enforcement? And, and I think it's an important question to ask because we, we saw some modest bump in driving, driver yielding when we had enforcement alone, but we didn't see the big bump in, in compliance until we started rolling out some of those engineering components. Now, so some people would look at our data and say, well, there you have it, there's the evidence that it was the engineering, but the study wasn't designed in that way. So we don't know if it was additive, super additive, it was a time-based component. And so now going into the spring of, of this coming year, you'll be seeing more blue feedback signs, but now in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and we're really gonna be working hard to tease out these components because it's such an important question to be asking. How effective are, are these high visibility enforcement programs? And can you do it without enforcement and so in Minneapolis we're going to be looking at engineering and enforce or excuse me engineering and education alone so you'll see those blue feedback signs and we'll be treating intersections both signalized and non-signalized in Minneapolis and be looking for the strength of, of improvement there and then in St. Paul we'll be doing a, a similar program but this time I'm going to be looking at enforcement only at a few sites and enforcement plus engineering and so really working hard to tease out these individual components because um, there, there are sort of the, the sides where, you know, Ash is, is driving this conversation about whether or not we should be using enforcement at all. But, but on the other side of it, you still have people saying, well, it works. Well, then we need, to, we need to really answer these questions on what strength do we really get and can we, can we achieve these programs with similar success by, by reallocating enforcement to be doing other duties if if we don't really need that component to, to traffic enforcement and, and to safety. I, Ash, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, Alex, I was wondering if this was a good time maybe to uh, touch on some pieces of, of 
uh, enforcement, perhaps, and our organizational stance on it? Uh, yeah, that, that would be great. That I was going, I can preface that with, um, yeah, I, I think enforcement always, it gets brought up and it's, uh, your research has been fascinating, Nicole, uh, talking about this and our streets has been vocal in talking about this and um, at the downtown uh, improvement district as well, Ben um, has taken different approaches with the stuff on Washington. So I really wanted to, to include this in the conversation, like what, what do we know about this, about what should we be thinking about when we're thinking about traffic enforcement, the history of it, the impacts of it, and um, its effectiveness. Yeah. And Ash, you can, yeah, you can start. Thanks, Alex. Um, so uh, when it comes to traffic enforcement, um, our streets Minneapolis has uh, been leading a lot of the conversations, like you said, Nicole, around whether we should be using traffic enforcement at all as a way to make our streets safer. So, I just want to give a little bit of background and context on how with our organization, we think about this topic. Now, I'd mentioned public health earlier. And so we are taking an approach in our work that is rooted in the principles of public health, which is uh, one of, you know, a central tenet is do no more harm. Um, this is kind of uh, enshrined in the, in the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take, for example. Um, and so this, what this means for us is that in any policy that we put forward or policy that we support, we thoroughly examine whether it exacerbates existing inequality or harms folks who have been marginalized in some way. Um, and our stance at Our Streets Minneapolis is that enforcement, we don't think is a good way to improve safety for two reasons. One, we know for sure that it disproportionately harms people of color in our communities. And the second thing is, uh, we know that there are just better tools that we uh, know for sure work. Um, this was a stance that took a long time to be created, informed by community stakeholders, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, staff members and board members. Uh, and we continuously kind of work to think about this deeply, recognizing that we are one of the few uh, POC-led transportation organizations in the country with a majority of POC staff and board. Um, and there's a really good blog post on our website put together by my co coworker, Emily Wade, uh, and um, in partnership with Alyssa Schaffman, who's a board member of ours, who they've really done deep research into kind of looking at the impacts of enforcement specifically on people of color across the country. And it's a really great resource for people who are just starting to think about this. Um, and so a couple of other points I want to make is, you know, we know that for years, for decades, transportation decisions have been used to segregate and, and even terrorize BIPOC communities, for example, the creation of our interstate system destroyed black homes and businesses across the country in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, uh, people of color disproportionately breathe worse air and are more likely to be hurt in a crash. Um, and uh, folks in black neighborhoods, you know, um, just don't have good access to biking, walking infrastructure as well. So all of these are decisions that have been made rooted in racism and segregation and we at Our Streets Minneapolis know that layered on top of this is also the violent reality of policing in transportation. Um, the city, Minneapolis is predominantly white, yet last year between June 2019 and May 2020, 78% of all police stops uh, were uh, police stops that searched people were of people who are black and East African while white people only make up 12% of the, of the stops in that time. And so, you know, we also think there's other insidious effects, you know, people who are undocumented are often detected and deported through traffic stops. And George Floyd himself was killed on our streets. And so we think that there's a better way, one that doesn't perpetuate more harm. And in Minneapolis, you know, we're having a lot of conversations around reimagining community safety. And our streets, Minneapolis, we think that transportation should be one of the first places we can start with reimagining community safety that doesn't depend on enforcement. Well, I'd like to go next. I think um, the things I would like to add to the conversation are just that I'm, I think that the work that Ash and Our Streets are doing is really thought provoking and I'm learning a lot from, from their leadership. I think I, I have a I mean, I'm just gonna acknowledge that I'm speaking from a position of privilege on this. I, my, my own lived experience with automated traffic enforcement has been positive. My family um, 
because my wife's work went over and lived in London for 2018 and the first half of 2019. And I saw a network of very narrow people-centered streets. And I had a three-year-old and a five-year-old at the time. And I felt safe going everywhere on foot with them on scooters. And those streets were, um, were made safer by red light cameras and speed cameras. So that there was a fully automated system. And I understand and acknowledge the questions about how you set that up so it doesn't exacerbate inequities. Um, but I'm, it was a, I saw the question in the, in the chat about why we don't have those. I think there, that's a whole topic on its own, but I do think it's something that I'm still interested in it in exploring because it can, because I see a pretty large and significant difference between a camera an automated camera based system. If it's set up well in consultation uh, with community, versus um, a system in which we're relying on cops to use their discussion to make traffic stops when they when they see fit. So it's I see those as different, very vastly different systems of enforcement, but I'm I'm early on in, in learning more about this. Nicole, did you want to respond to that or or Ash? So, you know, I have some of my, my research is in automated enforcement as well. And, and um, so, so we've looked at a number of things. Why, what are sort of the barriers in Minnesota for, for having it implemented? Currently, you, you really can't have automated enforcement. There's a bit of a, a myth that it is unconstitutional in Minnesota that is not true, but, but we do need legislative uh, authority to to allow cities like Minneapolis to enact automated enforcement. So we know that there, and I, and I put this in the chat, we know there are time and distance halos and crash reduction with automated enforcement. Uh, a lot of that comes from other countries where we have good research surrounding the efficacy of automated enforcement. Most of what I've looked at is at speed enforcement rather than red light camera enforcement. And, and so I think where we would see a, a lot of gains from um, automated enforcement in Minnesota would likely be on our highway system. And, and so this sort of gets to a, a slightly different conversation. We're talking about more rural safety, but I think that there, there are certainly some equity issues there in terms of, you know, um, we think about sort of an automated system being this unbiased system that, that then executes itself fairly, but there are always human decision making that goes into the to the build or the execution of even automated systems. So where do you put the cameras with what frequency? How do you set up the payment structure? Um, you know, I, I feel like that there is there is a good solution where we can find a, a balance to this, but but I'm sort of not I'm, I'm always sort of learning and absorbing more opinions on, on the topic, but I do feel that, that of, of the many alternatives that we have, if we're going to continue to engage in enforcement for traffic safety, I, I tend to appeal to, to people to think about automated enforcement over, over um, you know, in-person enforcement to alleviate some of the other escalations that we tend to see with traffic stops. Um, you know, and, and one of the things to think about in Minneapolis with, with the, the great disparities that we see in, in traffic stops uh, is that really Minneapolis doesn't do traffic enforcement and, and people sort of shake, scratch their head when I see that, but that's really true. Minneapolis Police Department does not have a dedicated traffic enforcement uh, division of the department. And so they do traffic enforcement as a component of other crime prevention. So, so when, when they're out doing stops, they're, they're not a part of their job is for traffic enforcement or for roadway safety. It's a pretense for other types of initiation of police activity. And, and that's really what is driving a lot of this where, where, they, where they have dedicated their, their police in the city and then they're using traffic stops as a way to, to execute these other aims. That's part of what's really driving this. So that's why it's really easy to be, you know, in Tangletown and speed around if you're a white person, because because they have decided that that you don't have other sort of hits that they're looking for, and and so that's really what drives this. So so 
even if you were to do automated enforcement, are we going to make sure that every neighborhood is equally treated with those cameras? And how are we going to, to treat the system with those cameras? It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of complicated discussions that have to be had. Yeah, um, and if, if I may, Alex, in, we've also thought a lot about automated enforcement at our streets, Minneapolis. And again, you know, Ben, you mentioned that you lived in, in London. My first job out of college was working for a company that actually worked for Transport for London. Uh, and I lived in London and I also saw, um, you know, the, the thing that I noticed was their streets were a lot narrower than ours. And the other thing I noticed about London was that um, there were literally street cameras on every single corner of the city. It almost, you know, London is one of the most um, surveil cities in in the world i would say and that's another thing that i want to talk about when it comes to uh, automated enforcement you know it's really a mass surveillance program we're going to be surveilling a whole bunch of our citizens uh, and the history of surveillance in this country you know has been used from the time um, of slavery to monitor and suppress people of color and we saw here in minneapolis after the uprising how police and other federal agencies were able to target people just based on snippets of images that they took from cameras. Um, and just two weeks ago, uh, a sanctuary city in California, uh, which was supposed to be protecting vulnerable uh, people, especially the undocumented, they were found to be sharing their traffic camera data with customs and immigration enforcement. And so while I hear you know, lots of ideas about how we can make our enforcement more equitable, that has just not been proven to be the reality and that uh, or for many people of color, where any of these programs have been found to have significant racial bias. Um, and the city of Minneapolis has been found to be repeatedly powerless when it comes to protecting our most vulnerable citizens. You know, For example, city council members often do not even know which police agencies are involved in operations until uh, days later. Um, and you know, we don't know why helicopters are flying about South Minneapolis, uh, for, for example. Um, and I think that a traffic camera program uh, will only increase harm to folks who are already marginalized. And we know that there are many, many other strategies that work really well. Um, and I think we need to, you know, uh, maybe, yeah, I'll just turn it back over to you, Alex. I think we're getting short on time. No, the, this is fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're running towards the end of, uh, of the hour. Um, but I mean, there's so much that we could talk about it just with enforcement alone. And I mean, I'd love to continue this conversation and invite you all back to talk about it more. I wish we had more time to talk about it today um, and we have a ton of questions. I'll make sure to, uh, to record those and, and to find a way to hopefully get answers out to everyone on those. Um, but before I wrap up, I wanted to, um, well, uh, I guess we do have to <laughs> wrap up. It's 1158, uh, but first I, I just wanna um, thank each of our, our panelists, Ash, Nicole, Ben, thank you so much for participating in this conversation. Again, there's a lot to talk about and hopefully we can do this again sometime and to continue to explore these subjects. If uh, for our audience, thank you so much for joining. If you're interested in the subject and you wanna continue the conversation, um, Ash, Nicole and Ben are all great follows on Twitter. Uh, shameless plug for their social media here. <laughs> their handles are at the bottom of the screen make sure to give them a follow and to check out their great work. Um, this webinar was recorded. So if you wanna go back and uh, share this conversation or, or revisit some of the topics that were discussed, uh, look for it on our website. We'll also send it out to everyone that registered for this soon. Uh, we hope to get that up today. And then, um, yeah, thank you all for attending. It, it's great to see everyone here, folks from all across the country. Uh, it's always amazing when we have um, such broad participation in a MOVE Minneapolis webinar. So really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, your years and we hope to see you back here again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody.